Welcome to Adjusted Reality, a podcast series trusted by the adjusted and brought to you by the Foundation for Chiropractic Progress, where we learn from athletes, celebrities, influencers, and healthcare professionals about how to optimize health in a fun, relatable way. Join me, Dr. Sherry McAllister, as I speak with professional endurance athlete, Zach Bitter, about his training, nutrition, mobility, and recovery. Zach Bitter specializes in ultra marathon distance events, an endurance coach, and a podcast host. He has broken multiple world and American records, participated on Team USA's 100 kilometer world championship team three times, including Team Gold in 2014, and won four national championships at the 50 mile, 100 kilometers, and 100 mile distances. Welcome to Adjusted Reality Podcast, Zach. Thanks so much for having me on. It's so fun to actually um, have an athlete who goes way beyond the ability to comprehend what a hundred mile looks like, let alone doing it at peak performance. So let's start with the very basics for the audience. What defines ultra marathon distance distance events? Yeah, it's a good question. I think uh, most people like within the sport would call like the 50 kilometer, which is 31.25 miles, kind of like the entrance event where it's like you've gone past that marathon distance and now you're in ultra. The sport is so interesting, though, in the sense that like the environment in which you do these races tends to be a lot more expansive than typical endurance events where you'll have races where you might be running on like super technical trail, really steep climbs and descents and being at like 10,000 feet elevation. So sometimes you'll even have distances that are shorter than a marathon from like a mileage or kilometer standpoint, but just the the duration of time it would take even like like internationally competitive professional athletes to complete go so far beyond the time it would take like their professional marathon counterparts that you'd probably lump that into ultra marathon as well. So I like to think of it as just like kind of like extreme running or extreme movement in the sense that you're going to be out there for a lot longer than what people would maybe expect to be for, for your traditional endurance events. So let's just go backwards in time because Zach didn't put on running shoes and decide I'm going for a hundred mile run. Mm -hmm. um, let's start as a youth. How did you actually get involved in these long distances? Yeah, I was very active as a kid. I think like a lot of that just had to do with, uh, you know, probably some just natural impulses on my part and personality wise, like I like to be active and, and movement was just something that was like, that I was attracted to. Uh, and then my parents kind of left that door wide open. So uh, my my opportunities to experience like a variety of different things, whether it be just like hopping on my bike and biking down to like the state park and running around out there and swimming and things like that, or doing some more organized sports in like the middle school and high school age range. I did all of that stuff. So it really was kind of like, I would look at kind of my pre-adult years as just very active with a wide range of things. And then uh, as I got older, I started to maybe more narrowly focus on running, but running specifically, I was first kind of exposed to that during a PE class where we did the presidential physical fitness challenge. And I think that was like, that's really my first experience where I just like really realized that like you weren't just like good or bad at sports. There were like, you know, sports you were better at than others. And then every person's going to have strengths and weaknesses. And you know, I realized there that my strength was probably in longer distance stuff, albeit it was a mile at that time. But for, you know, a fifth grader or sixth grader, however old well was at the time, like a mile was an eternity. So, you know, that was uh, that was distance running. And I sort of carried that into high school. I started as high school years went by, I started prioritizing cross country and track and field. By my senior year, those were like my, my primary focuses. I was uh, training in the off season before my senior or off season, I should say, like during the winter, I guess is technically when that would be versus trying to do like basketball or something else. And uh, yeah, and then college came around and uh, I went to college with zero anticipation of being a professional athlete or a professional endurance runner of any kind. Uh, but I knew that I liked running and that was going to be something that I'd like to have as like an activity in my life, uh, regardless of my profession. So I met with a cross country coach uh, and track coach there and just tried to get a feel of like what it was going to take to uh, run at the collegiate level and 
uh, I ended up uh, getting on a, a division three school team that was pretty competitive for, for division three or very competitive for a division three school. I was very moderate in terms of kind of how I fit into that, the competitiveness of that. And it really wasn't until the end of that experience and then kind of leaving that team structure and being able to sort of just like experiment with running on my own, where I realized I really, I really liked the very long stuff, like the ultra marathon type stuff. So I jumped to my first ultra marathon. I wouldn't say on a whim. I did plan for it, but uh, it was sort of an on, on accident in the sense that I was just looking for a race. And I had learned while doing that, that there was a, there was a 50 mile race within like an hour and a half of where I was living at the time and decided, you know what, I'll try this out, see how it goes. And I don't have to do another one for years if I don't want to, but at least I'll have that experience to kind of, uh, to base things off of. And I did that in, I think it was September of 2010. By that same time, the following year in 2011, I was kind of all in on ultra marathons. And from there on, I've been training for those, uh, pretty much exclusively, uh, since. So, I'm going back in time and, and, you know, there's, there's one thing to do cross country and there's a whole <laughs> other to do an ultra. If you go back to that very first race where you did your first ultra and the thought process of bringing you to that next level, because obviously there's the marathon distance, which is by no means way, shape or form an easy thing to do either, but what is it that you like? Let's say going past 26.2 miles. Tell me, dive deep into the, the, the psyche of it for, for our listeners who may have donned the running shoes and done a mile and thought, Hey, look at me and look what I've just done. What is it that keeps you going after 26 miles? Yeah, it's, it is interesting. I think, uh, for me, there's probably a combination of things. One was, when I did my first ultra marathon, I, I won that race. And like, that was semi new ah. in the sense that like, you know, my college experience, you know, I always had teammates that were faster than me. Um, my high school experience, even though I was the best on the team at like the state meet, you know, I wasn't winning state or anything like that. So I think there was a little bit of a draw from just like, Hey, this is a sport where maybe I'm just a little more competitive. And, and there was also a, a draw to it where when I was in college, that was the first time I really kind of started to understand like why you do certain workouts mm -hmm. and rather than just sort of like following orders from the coach in terms of like, okay, well, we're going to do this workout and just assuming, okay, well, that's, I guess what we should do to do get better. I started trying to like understand why and how and all that stuff and really think about which ones I liked and which ones I didn't like and which ones were harder for me to get excited about, which ones were more likely to create an injury for me or ones that I felt like I could kind of just do safely and stuff like that. So after college, the long run was the one that I kind of identified as my favorite workout of the week during that experience. And that sort of led into just like the uh, influencing my training quite a bit. And I spent actually a couple of years after college where I did very little speed work at all and just focused on kind of building volume and running for like the enjoyment of it. And uh, it wasn't until like a couple of years after college where I kind of started doing speed work on a more consistent basis again. And yeah, so I think that was kind of like a highlight for me that like longer was better. And that kind of got cemented in my mind at an early enough age that it kind of stuck. And uh, in the world of endurance sports, I shortly learned after that, that you can always go a little longer. And um, uh -oh. I wouldn't put my... <laughs> yeah, Danger. Yeah, always right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, just interesting in that, in that regard where I wouldn't put myself in the category of someone because ultra running is a little different, I think, than then kind of some of the Olympic distances is where a lot of times when people get excited about doing like five Ks, 10 Ks, half marathons and marathons, they sort of get into a, a pattern of like, okay, I did it this fast. What do I need to do to get faster? And then, then I kind of mm -hmm. keep working at that and fine tuning that skill. Whereas an ultra running, there is some of that. And I definitely fall into that category to a large degree. Uh, but there's also this other kind of uh, draw of, well, I just ran 50 kilometers. That was the furthest I've ever run before. I wonder what it's like to run 50 miles and then you do that. And then there's another race a little bit longer. That's inviting. That's hundred kilometers, then hundred miles. And it's just endless. There's races that are 3,100 miles in length where oh. you're running around a, like just over half mile loop for 16 hours out of the day, all summer long, essentially. And, and so you, there's really like no end to it. <laughs> and that draws a lot of people and things like that. And, you know, that was kind of an exciting piece to it too, that there was this other kind of side to running outside of just the fine tuning a specific distance. Uh, and then, like I kind of said earlier, you just have all these options with a different environment where I'd have friends who are like highly competitive, like road and track runners, 
sort of get burnt out by that stuff and then hop on the trails and start running some trail races and then get like really reinvigorated by that environment. And that drew them into ultra running. And then they had like a resurgence in their running career and their love for running. So just seeing all that kind of happen around me as I was also participating in, I think was like uh, flashing some light bulbs in my head that was, t- was telling me like, this is kind of a cool sport to to get into. And um, finally, as, along with all of that, I just, timing was so perfect for me in the sense that when I did my first ultra marathon, we were seeing this like beginning of another upswing in the popularity of that sport. When I was in college, no one really, at least I didn't know what ultra marathons were. The average person, even runners were very unfamiliar with what it was and why it was there. And if anything, there was a little bit of a taboo about it where these are these crazy people who are like just out there running around in the woods, not really caring about anything. And (laughs) <laughs> and uh since then it's grown a lot as we've seen just like more structure come into the sport more people come into the sport right more household names introducing it to people who otherwise wouldn't hear about it so you sort of get like this reverse where now ultra runners are probably looked at as like i'm sure we're still looked at as crazy <laughs> by by the average person but there's a little bit more of an appeal to it as like wow i wonder you know people are starting to ask themselves i think the question that i, I asked myself at one point which is like i wonder what it would be like to do that and then that experience can draw you out. And it's a very slippery slope sport where you do one, you may have some miserable experiences during the race and you may have some like incredible highs and you finish and you're just like, you almost feel like you lived a, like a very like exciting life in a, in the compact day or something like that. And and that kind of teaches you, I think, to like appreciate what you can learn about yourself in a very short period of time and how you can kind of take those lessons and, and apply them to your everyday life and things like that. So I think that's what ends up drawing people to it. And I think that's a really cool kind of side of the sport. I can see that. In fact, we had Colin O'Brady as one of our guests, and he is a 10-time world record holder and some really crazy things that he has done. I mean, just amazing athletic ability and having you with the athletic ability and probably getting the first kick out of winning the first ultra that you, I mean, that, that in and of itself would do it for me. If if I won a (laughs) a gold, I'd be like, Hey, I'm good. I got to keep going. Cause there's something about it that drives us And you're right. It is absolutely an adventure and it's an adventure in your own personal, um, fortitude. How are you, how much resilience do you have in the tank? How much tenacity can you pull when the going gets really tough. And I think you summarized it really well, which is you're living almost several days in one day experience because you go from the ultimate highs of, wow, look what I just did to the ultimate lows with his energy. And I don't know why I'm doing this. And this is crazy. And (laughs) you know, my body hurts and I'm not sure I can finish. Your training though, is at such a high level that um, I I would like you to kind of go through uh, some of, to get to where you are and and know that it's one thing to finish an ultra marathon, it's another to win an ultra marathon. And you talked a lot about training and you kind of figured out early that there's a lot in it to know about it. And you mentioned speed work and that's oftentimes of the athletes that I've talked with that's usually the time that most athletes actually get injured. And so talk to us a little bit about what your training um, looks like and some of the workouts that you absolutely hate and some that you love. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, when it comes to running ultra marathons, I think as like the sport has grown, we've seen more, more people just expose themselves to it and a little more like careful eyes studying the different protocols and things like that. We start to get a little more detail. Whereas when, when I first got into it, it seemed like people just went out and ran long. And then when they were tired, they stopped. And then they kind of repeated that process over and over again. And, uh, since then, uh, I think we realized there's still very good application for the variety of different workouts that you're going to see in kind of more standard endurance events. It just becomes like a little bit more of like, uh, the order of operations is kind of how you kind of construct those. So I still think like most endurance events, you're best off kind of having a really strong foundation, which is going to be a lot of like relatively lower intensity base building where you're just kind of getting used to running at a relatively easy effort and spending some time just kind of getting used to that, building that foundation where it kind of maybe shifts for ultra runners versus like say 5k runners or something like that is what kind of comes next. If you're looking at like 
some of these shorter distance events, they're run at a relatively high intensity comparatively. So those events are going to want to have some of those shorter, faster intervals that mimic race pace closer to the race itself. Ultra running is the same thing. It just happens to be that the race distance is so long that the pace is going to be slow in order to sustain it. So rather than doing things like short intervals and a lot of speed work near the end of the plan, you might be spending a lot of your training load and energy and time into developing out your like your long run, or in some cases, your back to back long run, where you run like for a pretty long period of time for two days in a row and really try to mimic and practice the things you'll be doing on race day. So for me, what that usually means, like if I'm training for a hundred mile race is once I know that I've, I've got a good foundation in place, I might start out with like short intervals. Uh, those I'll usually do between 30 seconds or as short as 30 seconds, I should say upwards to maybe four minutes, but regardless of their disc or their time duration, they're going to be at an intensity that I could sustain for say maybe 12 to 15 minutes in like a race setting. And I'm going to do those in a framework of kind of like one to one, where if I'm doing 30 second intervals, I'm going to do a 30 second easy jog or walk between and kind of repeat those for a dosage that I'm, that I'm capable of handling, uh, at the time with leaving a few, few on the table. I like to say, like, I rarely try to do a workout where at the end, I feel like I'm exhausted the way I would be at the end of like a peak race. Uh, cause that oftentimes just takes future training off the table. Um, and then since that's really unspecific to the pace we're running for hundred miles, I just gradually start moving closer to that. So then I might move into like a focused phase where I'm working on what we call like long intervals, which is going to be like an intensity that most people are going to be able to sustain for about 60 minutes in like a race setting. And I'm kind of structuring those in a similar interval fashion. A lot of times they're just going to be longer, like maybe closer to 10 uh, or, or eight, I should say eight minutes up to like sometimes even 20 minutes. And instead of having a one-to-one -one work ratio, I'm more like a two-to-one where for every two minutes of running work, I'll take a minute of rest in between. So if that's a 10 minute interval, I'd have like a five minute recovery between those. And I'll dose those the same way where I'm trying to kind of build up my ability to tolerate that and watch my pace improve at that intensity. And, uh, and yeah, and kind of get that fitness set in before kind of moving into that phase where I'm really going to start focusing primarily on building out my long run. And that kind of follows this overreaching theme of kind of being least or doing the, the least specific things that are still important, maybe some weaknesses that you're trying to address, whether that be an imbalance uh, or something like that early on in the plan. But then as you get close to the race itself, it's time to like kind of turn your energy towards the things you're going to be doing most specifically on, on race day itself. Gotcha. Now, most of the training has to be congruent with your nutrition. And that I think is one of the things that, that really does keep the ultra marathoner on guard is being able to look at their nutrition as almost a scientific formula because you know how many calories you're burning and you also know that with poor nutrition comes poor recovery. So if if you could take maybe just a sample day of uh, eating while you're training, what, what would that look like? And then if you would um, take us through an ultra marathon um, where you're trying to get in the calories that you need to sustain that long distance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a really good question. So for like my daily nutrition, I tend to skew a little more lower carbohydrate, uh, mostly just because that works for me. And it allows me to kind of like minimize the amount of carbohydrates I would need on race day versus what I would need if I was following like a moderate or high carbohydrate diet. So like, here's kind of a sample of what I had the other day during a training during a training day, I like woke up in the morning, I had coffee with some cream. I put in some like elements, electrolytes in with that and a little bit of honey. So I like to kind of have pretty empty stomach when I start a workout. So liquid calories, if I'm going to have them, a little bit of caffeine from the, from the coffee. Uh, post run is where I'm going to kind of have my first pretty big meal of the day. So or first meal, full meal of the day. That was some like whole fat yogurt, an apple, handful of walnuts, uh, two SVLs life bars, smoothie that had strawberries and SVL train in it. Uh, I tend to go towards like stuff that's a little more kind of like smoothie type liquidy after a warm weather run, which we're in the kind of still finishing off the heat of summer. So that tends to right. be something that sits in my stomach a little better right after the run when I need, know I need to get some calories in to kind of prepare myself for whatever I'm going to do next. Uh, then a little bit later in that day, kind of mid afternoon, I had some scrambled eggs, cheese, spinach, salt, and salsa, just kind of like a, a general scramble that I made. Um, then dinner that night, I had salmon uh, boiled broccoli and beets and bone broth, some olive oil, cheese, nutritional yeast, a potato, sunflower seeds, and salt kind of in a stir fry type of, type of manner. And that was, that's kind of a pretty standard, like 
range of what my macronutrient profiles are going to look like on a on a, a typical day training and eating. That's beautiful. I it, it, the thing that I loved about it is it's as close to whole as you can possibly get. And that mm-hmm. in in today's world where things have been turned upside down for many people, it's just going back to, you know, find the perimeter of the grocery store and mm-hmm. and look at what what is it that you enjoy and your body talks to you and I'm sure you've had those moments where I'm like not doing that again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let's let's walk through now your let's take a long run, a hundred miles. Okay. And you're gearing up for that and you know what you need to have with you. And also sometimes when you have those stomach upsets, um, what you're, what you're dealing with. So walk us through a hundred miler and some of the things that, um, obviously you can't tell us all of it because that's a long run, but what are some of the things you take with you? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. So once I get to race day prep, I'm usually thinking of it like as in a couple of ways where there's a lot of products out there that you can use that are kind of designed for intra-race like sports products. I think those things have value. Uh, One of the problems they are going to present with things like ultra marathoning is the time at which you're going to do them. So it's like, it's one thing to have like, like a gel or a bar or like a sports drink or something like that, like once or twice during like a a marathon or a half marathon or something like that. It's a whole nother thing to be doing that all day long Mm -hmm. and having expecting your body to kind of like, just take that, that real like kind of refined process thing in and and not have an issue with it. In fact, uh, the most recent position paper in ultra marathon single day races, uh, reported that there was like, I think just over 50% of participants are going to experience some form of gastrointestinal issue, uh, from just like the, you know, the ins and outs of running all day and trying to consume food and stay hydrated and all that stuff, uh, throughout the process of it. So that is a challenge. All ultra runners are going to have to probably try to get over in some shape or form. So, you know, for me, like one thing I do to try to minimize that is, uh, by kind of having a little bit less carbohydrate in my daily diet, which allows me to kind of sit just underneath what they would normally recommend for someone who's on a moderate to high carbohydrate diet in terms of what they're going to fuel with during a race itself. So for me, that still means I'm going to want it to be taking in carbohydrate sources because your glycogen stores are the thing that you could potentially deplete. Like when endurance athletes, you take the leanest endurance athlete you could find, they're going to have much more body fat available for energy than they will glycogen stores. So defending your muscle, defending your body fat stores is unnecessary during a race itself. Uh, so then it comes down, like, how do you defend those muscle glycogen? For me, that's like somewhere in the neighborhood of like 30 to 40 grams per hour is what would be suggested for a hundred mile race that I would need, uh, to kind of do that. Uh, then the next question is, well, what are you doing that with? So right. for me, I like to do kind of a dual, uh, trade-off between kind of some liquid sport product type stuff. Uh, I'll use a, a product called S feels race plus for that. And then I'll use a solid food option, which is just going to kind of slow down that absorption rate a little bit, having that solid food kind of balance going back and forth and kind of minimize a little bit of one of the issues that can create problematic digestive issues where your body's kind of drawing fluid into your digestive tract in a way where it creates a, you know, an environment where you, you have those issues. So, uh, I'll usually try to turn to something that's got a little bit of different flavor profile and different consistency. So since my sports product is liquid, a little bit more sweetie, sweet tasting, I'm going to turn to something that's a little more crunchy, a little more salty. So it could be something as simple as like a salted cracker, um, you know, a piece of bread with maybe some nut butter and and honey on it, uh, stuff like that are going to kind of make up my whole food option. And I'll just be kind of going back and forth between those targeting that kind of 30 to 40 gram per hour rate. I'll usually split that into kind of like two, uh, rather than just kind of doing that all at once every hour, I'll usually spread that out like with two or three servings per hour so that it's kind of following a little bit more of a, like kind of a nibbling on it versus trying to like eat it in, in whole pro or whole batches uh, side of things. And then, um, hydration wise, is where it gets interesting because there's just no way you can stay perfectly hydrated over the course of a full hundred mile race. Uh, the, 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 the amount of fluid your body can process, uh, even if it's well-trained, isn't going to typically meet the demands. Uh, so thankfully, since the duration is so long and the intensity comes lower, you can run a little bit lower levels of hydration without performance getting compromised the way it would maybe at a little bit of a faster event. So, you're kind of advised to not try to keep up with your sweat weights rates perfectly. Uh, a lot of the research would indicate that kind of peak 
fluid consumption is going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of like 27 to 33 ounces per hour or right around a liter. So depending on the heat of the day, you know, I might push up to that, but either way, I'm going to probably have about five to 700 milligrams of electrolytes for every liter of water I consume. Gotcha. Uh, so that's kind of the other piece of the puzzle is you have your hydration and electrolytes and you have your, your, your food or your fuel. So I'm always kind of trying to like, make sure I have those all balanced throughout the course of the day. And the more consistent I can be with that, the more likely I'm going to feel strong at the end of the race and able to uh, kind of finish, finish strong versus kind of fade off and hobble my way to the finish line, which right. does happen sometimes. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's an interesting endeavor because we try new things sometimes just because we want to try new things. And those new things can lead you down the garden path of I'll never do that again. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, practice of nutrition is probably something that is, is ingrained in you is, okay, I know the length of run I'm going to do. And I know exactly when I'm going to eat almost timed. Are, are you that strict or do you just kind of listen to your body? Where, where do you sit on? Cause a hundred miles is a long race. Um, and you can tell oftentimes just what your body is telling you back is, Hey, I may need some more, um, hydration. Maybe I'm, it's time to, to eat. But I think, Many of the the runners that I know say, if if you wait till you actually note, it's too late. So what, what's mm -hmm. your thought on that? Yeah, I mean, there's a little bit of intuition you can use. I think like with hydration, especially as long as you have the right blend of electrolytes and fluids, you can sort of, you can sort of like trust your thirst to a large degree. You might have to do a little preempting if it's going to be really warm. Uh, and at the end stages of races where you just kind of lose motivation. So like those signals may be there. You may just be kind of like lackadaisical in terms of responding to them, in which case then having like kind of a set timeline of like, I'm going to have fluids at this particular interval, or I'm going to eat at this particular interval can be a very useful practice. Um, when it comes to like, uh, when it comes to just like what it is you're going to take into, I think this is another thing where like, sometimes your body also gives you a pretty good sign of what you maybe want. So like, it, the the kind of ultra marathon example here is we have these aid stations a lot of times where it's just like a table full of like everything you could imagine um in terms of just like different types of like kind of snack foods it was what you'd probably categorize in that outside of a race and if you go up and look at that like if your mind goes straight to the salty pretzels or something like that chances are your body's maybe asking for like a little more sodium uh and then that may be where you want to kind of favor your your fueling or if you see like uh, you know, the, like a, a glass of soda or something like that. And you're like, Oh, that looks really, really good right now. Your body might just be kind of dipping a little bit into your muscle glycogen stores further than it would like. And it's kind of saying like, you know, give me that fast acting sugar right now. I could use that sort of a, a sort of a mindset. So I think you can kind of lean on that to some degree, but you do want to be mindful not to get like too aggressive with that either, because, uh, another example is like you go in and you actually feel a little hungry or, you know, you should eat or you, you missed a feeding interval or something like that. And then you go and you eat like an entire sandwich and, or like a full slice of pizza, which sounds crazy, but that does happen in some ultra marathons. <laughs> and then you, it, it feels so good at first, but then you leave that ace and you start running and you realize like now my stomach feels, feels like really kind of disturbed because just like, I just put too much volume in there for something for, for, for moving, you know, like it, like if I was going to sit down and eat that and then not get back up, not a big deal, but if you got to kind of keep running after that, you got to be kind of be mindful of portion size. So for those type of scenarios, usually what I'll say is like, you know, grab that sandwich or whatever it is that you think you're going to want all of have like a quarter or a third of it, and then take the rest with you run for a little bit and see how that feels in your stomach. And then if that feels good, then start nibbling on the rest of it versus trying to try to you know, go overboard and not have a, a, a solution on how to kind of get back out of that. That makes good sense. You know, at, as you get to the end of a race and, and having completed a race, recovery is critical because it's going to tell you, can I take that next race or not? Did I injure myself bad enough that um, I might need to actually take time off? And there's, there's, those are the words, those two words that no athlete ever wants to hear, which is time off. It's, it scares them. It, um, it's rather intimidating, but, but share with me a little bit about, I know, from experience, balance is a big part of running. And um, going back in time as an athlete for you, um, starting to learn your body and what it means, um, talk to us a little bit about mobility and recovery on, you know, how do you get through it? And what are the things you're thinking of? 
Yeah, for sure. I think like a lot of times I'll learn the most about myself and what my needs are within mobility is when I will get injured. And, you know, like, thankfully I've been injured very few times since starting ultra marathon running, but every time I have, it's never just the injury itself that I learn about us. So I always identify like a few other things. And some of that's just having like the time and energy to maybe like explore that world in a little more detail. It's also, as you probably know, like it's rarely like the exact area that hurts. That's problematic. It's usually something down downstream or, or up the chain or something that's off. And, and a lot of times those can kind of like trigger those. So then you start to recognize like where in your normal movement environment, you're making these mistakes. And I think like the common one, a lot of times is sitting, you know, you're sitting in a chair all day long or in a car seat or something like that, that puts your body in a very specific position. And if that position is problematic for the position you're going to be in running, you're going to have some uncomfortable experiences potentially come up from not really like exposing your body to the position it, it needs to be in to perform. So for me, a lot of times that ends up being like ankles, hips, hamstrings uh, tend to be ones where I have to spend a little more time focusing on putting myself in positions where those stay strong and mobile so that my running is smooth and I don't pick up little nagging injuries that come along the way. So I've got a list of different things that I like to kind of keep pretty frequent in my program and uh, those include things like uh, like active range of motion stuff with my hamstring. So there's a guy on um, on Instagram, uh, Jesse Fuller, I think his handle's like at Fuller Runs Far. It does like a a ton of like movement type stuff, and uh, he had a, a post that had this this like full range hamstring uh, protocol that I'll use a lot. And it's uh it starts with this like kneel. You kneel on one knee and you kind of like rock forward and then lean back. And when you lean back, you go like straight leg. And that gives a good, like kind of dynamic stretch on your hamstring. In other words, like you, you stand with like a resistance band around your waist mm -hmm. and then kind of have the other side of that resistance band around your foot. And then you put that foot up on top of like a bench or a chair and then just like rotate and twist. And you're going to engage the hamstring dynamically a little bit differently with that one. Um, there's a couple more that you're on your back and one is like you have your leg up on the wall and your second leg is just straight out and you just raise it up and down. Uh, and then in that same position, you do the same, you do the same thing, but instead of raising your leg up and down, you kind of slide it away from your body and back towards your body. Those moves have been really helped me with like, kind of, uh, like some hamstring and hamstring tendinopathy type issues in the past. Uh, I really like, um, the, like the heel, a heel sit position. Cause I've had mm -hmm. some ankle mobility issues in the past. Uh, and that really, if I do that, plus with like a little bit of a slight lean back and things like that. I really can kind of open up that, that dorsal flexion on my ankle. Uh, I also really like calf raises kind of for the same, like ankle strengthening and mobility. I'd like to kind of do two combinations of that though. I'll do like a bent knee and a straight knee. So I'm kind of engaging that calf muscle and strengthening that the muscles and tendons and ligaments around the ankle in a slightly different rate way. Uh, then things like tibialis raises, I think are really important for runners, especially if you have like things like shin splints and stuff like that. Like a lot of runners, they don't really realize there's a muscle that goes right down there. Yeah. And it's not just a shin bone. It's the muscle <laughs> down there. You strengthen that muscle and those shins are going to feel a lot better. So I've done a lot more tibialis raises and like tibialis band work and things like that over the last couple of years. Uh, another one I really like is a couch stretch. Um, I'll pair that with some kneeling hip flexor stretches. I just think that really opens things up that are normally getting a little tight if I'm sitting a lot, uh, for, for stuff that, uh, gets me kind of ready for a run or ready for a workout. And then just some hip flexor band pulls. And especially with ultra running, you get like, especially get on the trails, you'll have like, you know, you have your knee drive, which is going to be an important aspect to running. And now you decide to run up a hill. You need that knee drive even more, which means that hip flexor needs to be nice and strong. So you can continually lift your leg up there and you don't start like dragging it over the course of like the end of a long race. If that starts to fatigue. So those tend to, that's, that's, kind of a pretty comprehensive view of what I'm typically doing on a regular basis with mobility. And I'll introduce other things from time to time. If there's specific things that are nagging me or things that I think are going to be, be useful. Um, like in the past, I've done some chiropractic work, like active release therapy to like open up some areas that got kind of tight and were probably problematic towards, uh, hurting other areas that were taking that impact because the spots that were, were tight, weren't, weren't working with that proper range of motion as well as I would have liked. And did, did you get involved in chiropractic, um, as you started ultra running or how did chiropractic fit into your, your schedule? Yeah, no, I got into chiropractic at a pretty early age. My, my mom would take me to the chiropractor quite a bit when I was younger on a little more of a routine nature. Uh, so that was kind of my introduction to it as a profession. And then once I got into running it, it's, it, it was like 
it kind of interesting. I actually, it felt like the chiropractic field kind of began to grow and expand uh, as I got older to where like, you know, people sometimes I think stereotype it as like, oh, you're just going to get your back and neck cracked. And it's like, like, and it's hard to kind of make a connection there with running. But then you go into like a chiropractic office nowadays, and I think there's like a lot more application of like, well, let's figure out what's causing this issue and then come up with a program that's going to actually like, like solve the issue at hand here versus just like, give you some short term relief and then have you return. And, and that's been my, my experience most recently with chiropractic work is kind of having that like more like holistic view of the thing of like, well, where's this pain being caused from versus where's the pain manifesting and then kind of putting together a program that's going to like reverse the course that kind of puts you in that position in the first place. And that I find very, very useful. I think it, I think you nailed it on that one, Zach is it, it's one thing to take a pill for a pain. It's another to set the transition from imbalance where your body is telling you something and it's, you go to the chiropractor and you start to understand that as the body moves and shifts and becomes tight in some areas and perhaps not as strong because the imbalance is starting to creep in, you favor your left heel strike. It's been heavy on the up when you're going up the hills, you you really push down harder on that left heel. The chiropractor is there to say, okay, hold on a second. Let's, let's look at the cause of what causes you to be a little heavy on the left versus the right. And I, I think that's one of the critical parts of recovery as well is that it's, it's one thing to take the pain away. It's another to fix the problem and recovery for an, an ultra marathoner is critical because the next time you go out, if you're not starting to recover and allow the muscles, the tendons, the ligaments in the body fatigue wise to heal, it, it becomes kind of a pattern of distress for the entire system. Tell us a little bit about recovery in terms of sleep. How mm. good are you with sleep and how much of an important factor does it play for you? Yeah, sleep is huge. I, you know, I think of like, kind of like the pillars of uh, training that are going to move the needle the most or things that you should probably establish first before you start adding all the kind of fun, cool looking stuff, so to speak. And one of those is sleep, I think it's sleep, nutrition, and then proper training load. So uh, or recovery is the side of it that I would kind of lump sleep into. So on that recovery side, I think the first thing to kind of share is that you could have you can have a great workout, uh, you don't get stronger from that workout. You don't get better from that workout. You get better from recovering from that workout. So uh, when when I when I'm working with someone or I'm looking at my own training, if I'm having a good training session, I know that, that means it's just that much more important that I get good quality sleep and recover from it before I kind of uh, try to stress that system again. So sleeping is kind of always been a big focus point of mine. And I, I kind of treat it the same way I would a consistency with a training plan where I know if I can consistently execute the workouts that I know that are going to get me to where I want to be, that's going to make it much more likely that I have a good outcome at the race itself. Just like if I am sleeping well consistently uh, throughout my training plan, I'm much more likely to uh, be able to leverage that hard work I put in towards getting better versus stagnating or regressing or getting injured or anything that kind of comes along with poor sleep quality and lack of recovery and things like that. So, you know, for me, I, uh, I, I tend to do best when I can average between say like eight or nine hours of sleep per night. So I'm usually trying to hit around there or set up a, you know, a schedule where I can have the, the flexibility to be able to sleep around that, that amount of time. And, you know, it's not always perfect. There's nights where I'll get less than that. And then usually um, if I'm smart and give myself the space, there'll be like a little bit of catch up within a day or two of that, where I'll sleep a little bit longer than that, but it usually always averages out to be around eight and a half hours or so. It's interesting as we move through into recovery, one of the things that has become more and more focused on is, is sleep ergonomics and mm. starting to understand that a body that's gone through an ultra marathon is a body that is going to still need a a very deeper REM sleep and getting in positions of, of comfort. They may not always be in our best 
sleep ergonomics. Um, are you a side sleeper? Or are you a back sleeper? Do you tend to move around? Are you using pillow supports? I'm sure your chiropractor has talked a lot about this, but a lot of our audience is often like, what is sleep ergonomics? I've never heard of it. And it is actually a very important part of getting a deeper um, night's rest. Yeah. Yeah. I would say like, I I'd probably blend a few different things. I find that like, if I, if I fall, if, if I fall asleep on my back, I tend to kind of stay there. Um, I might get up and use the bathroom once or something like that, and then move to a different position. Uh, but usually it's, uh, I'll, I'll use a, a pillow just to kind of keep my, my head kind of level with my shoulders more or less. And if I'm sleeping on my side and then just try to find like a pretty comfortable position. And I don't, I, that's actually something I should maybe look at as in terms of like what percentage of the time I'm doing one or the sure. other. Uh, but for, for better or worse, or I'm, I suppose it's probably better. I'm pretty deep sleeper. So like once I fall asleep, it's like, I'm sleeping and I'm not really sure if I'm rolling around that much or not. I'm just yes. like out. <laughs> so, uh, it's good though. Cause when you push your body that hard and, and this is one of the things that I think, you know, COVID did play a role in a lot of us having the sleep disturbance and probably not as active. It sounds like you really kept a, a really solid p- pace during COVID, but oftentimes when we do s- step out of our sleep patterns and it's, it's a little harder to get back into them until you start to get your body really active. And I think with an ultra marathon, your body just knows it's time to rest. You have a finely tuned machine. It's like a Ferrari. You take it into the garage, you turn off the engine and it's done. Mm -hmm. Um, It's it's really getting to be that place where people starting to get back into running or they this is the first time they've ever been heard of an ultra marathon. Um, Tell our audience, I know this is a big step and it's not an easy question, but Many are getting into running because they know the benefits of running. And some really, like you, you you didn't know that 100 miles was going to be fun until you did 100 miles, right? And then you won, which is even better. Tell our audience um, possibly three tips that you would give them on their journey um, through the athletic portion of running. Yeah, it's a really good question. So like, I would say like some of the biggest ones are like starting at your own level versus trying to pair it something that someone else is doing, or even parroting what you've done in the past, if you're a returning runner, uh, just because like, really, it's all about it's called micro stressing, you want to stress your system just enough to drive a response, but you don't want to do like a macro stress in the sense where now the next quality session you're going to do is is off because you haven't recovered from the first one. And then over time, you're not uh, actually getting the same training load as you would if you were just at your own level and, and kind of sticking with it. And that also makes it more enjoyable in the sense that you don't feel like you're pulling teeth every time you go for a workout because you're kind of meeting yourself where you're at. So just be honest with yourself there. If you're feeling sore, tired and overworked from a certain training process, you know, that might be a sign that you should scale back a little bit and let your body adjust before kind of taking that next stage. And I mean, you give it enough time. It's a patient person sport for that reason. You give enough time, you will get to that point where, you know, you'll look at your training program. You're like, wow, I'm doing twice as much as I used to, and I'm recovering faster. And it's just like kind of an amazing process. So starting at your own level is definitely key though, to make sure you, you, you're able to stick with it. Um, next is like, uh, the consistency kind of trumps any single workout. I kind of alluded to this in the first one, but like, uh, if you go out and do like a killer workout, it might feel great to be able to say, oh yeah, I nailed that workout or I rang myself dry at that workout. But if that makes it hard to do another workout for the rest of the week, you have to ask yourself, did you do the same amount of training over the course of that week as you did in that one day? And if not, you probably left some potential fitness gains on the table for that. And it becomes a little bit higher of an injury risk too. So consistency always is going to be better than, than just like having a heroic single workout. Um, the next one is just like learning perceived effort with certain tools like talk tests. So you can uh, kind of understand how hard you're actually running because different phases of training are going to, re- are going to be useful to target different intensities and actually knowing if you're actually in those intensities or not is, is important. And perceived effort can be a pretty good gauge of that once you kind of learn that. So for new runners, sometimes it's hard to kind of connect those dots early on. Uh, so using things like talk tests where you can gauge how hard you're pushing based on how easy it is to like, say, like speak a couple sentences, or if you can only get a couple words out, it can be an indication that you're in like a little bit of a higher intensity zone. Uh, I think you can use heart rate and things like that, 
uh, for these metrics to some degree early on as well. Uh, personally, I like them a little better as like post-workout analysis tools to kind of like see where the improvements are. So like, for example, if someone is running a specific pace at 150 beats per minute, and then four weeks later, we notice their pace is 15 or 20 seconds per mile faster at that same heart rate. Given the same environment, we can stand to assume that they're making improvements. They're getting faster at the same effort. Uh, those are kind of the 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 three, and I'll add a bonus one if you don't mind, which is just order Please of operations. <laughs> order of operations is key, I think, and that's where it's important, I think, to pick. Uh, if you can, I mean, some people, people are always running for different purposes, but if you decide like, hey, I want to do a 5K or, hey, I want to do an ultra marathon, that can help you guide like when to do certain things in your training. So having that kind of that end goal in place, not only can be a motivator to get you started and get you to remain consistent throughout the plan, but it can also help you develop that order of operations of when to do certain things. Outstanding. Well, I think our audience has a lot to really reflect on in getting their journey on track. And speaking of track, when is the next big event for you? <laughs> Yeah. So I actually, um, I'm actually coming off an injury I had earlier this summer, but, uh, I seem to have navigated that well and have been getting pretty good training in the last couple, couple weeks or it's getting to months at this point. So, uh, I'm confident enough where I can probably start looking at events. And I would say like the earliest I'll probably do a hundred mile would be in December. Um, and then the latest would probably be early next year, like January, February timeline. So either way, I'm going to start doing some racing. I think I'll probably do some shorter stuff in the lead up to it just for fun and as like some higher quality workouts and work my way back up to either 100K or 100 mile this December and then uh, start planning out 2023 from there. Beautiful. I love the passion, the energy, and the motivation that you bring talking about running and just getting out there and enjoying it. There's one thing to do it. There's another to love it. And it is clear, Zach, that you absolutely love what you do. And that brings the passion in everybody's life. And that is the adjusted reality. So I want to thank you so much for being with us today. And we wish you luck on the next hundred miles. Yeah, thanks a bunch for having me on. I want to thank you for tuning in to Adjusted Reality as we spoke to professional athlete Zach Bitter about endurance training, nutrition, mobility, and recovery. Recall he said, be honest with yourself. That is the key to not burning yourself out by pushing too hard. And you want to continue to make it fun. Also, consistency. Nothing says it better than practice makes permanent. Not perfect, because if you practice wrong, it is going to be indebted into your continued growth. So practice makes permanent. Why? Well, it's going to help with your consistent movements. So consistency is the journey. And that is what Adjusted Reality is all about. Go out there. Find what makes you happy and enjoy the experience. Chiropractic helps keep the journey moving forward and helps to build a stronger future, no matter what life throws at you. 100 miles or your next journey to a big office event, it doesn't matter because you know one thing, that if you take care of that beautiful machine that you're sitting in right now, it's going to be a big, brave, bold, beautiful day. So take the time to take care of you. This podcast was brought to you by the Foundation for Chiropractic Progress. And as a special gift for listening today, you can visit f4cp.org slash health to get a copy of our Mind, Body, Spirit ebook, which focuses on many ways to optimize your health and the ones you love without the use of drugs or surgery. Don't forget to subscribe, share this podcast with your friends, families, and loved ones, rate it and review it. We can't do it without you. And we look forward to having you join us on our next episode of Adjusted Reality. Mm -hmm.